Okay. Okay. So why don't you uh, introduce yourself and what you do? With I'm. Uh, my name's Andrew Tyndall. I uh, publish the Tyndall Report, which analyzes television network news. I've been uh, doing this for the past uh, 16 years, and uh, I look at the network nightly news each night and measure what stories they cover and, and how much time they spend on various topics and trends. So why the television news? Why follow that? Um, it's the uh, most widely watched, most widely consumed news delivery medium of all of all news uh, in any medium. Okay, hold on. When yeah. you say uh, when you say it, um, I'm, I'm going to be television. My, right, I understand. Uh, okay. I'm going to be cutting my voice out. So. The re the reason I watch television news is because of all news media, uh, internet, radio, print, anything. More people get their news on a day to day basis from television news than any other source. Okay, great. And um, what kind of trends did you see leading up to the? Um, my film is focusing on, you know, starting in like August and November up until March of '03. So, mm -hmm. of that time period, what sorts of trends did you see of the of the media and how much coverage Iraq was getting? Okay, um, in the six months before the invasion happened. Uh, Iraq was by far the most heavily covered story of all stories. So it wasn't that the network news didn't uh, pay, uh, lack, lacking, didn't lack any attention that they paid to that story. It was uh, overwhelmingly the biggest foreign policy story, but it was also bigger than any domestic uh, story as well. So uh, what we have to look at is not uh, whether they covered that story, but how they covered that story. And how did they cover the story? Um, as with almost all um, big foreign policy stories, the agenda, the news agenda is set by the administration in power at the time. And that means that the dominant beats where you're going to cover a story like this will be first from the White House and then from the other parts of the government, the Pentagon and the State Department. What was um, the other beat that would have uh, got a lot, that did get a lot of attention during that time was the United Nations because there was a lot of debates going on in the United Nations. What was interesting in particular about the way the build-up to the war was covered was that it was covered first and foremost as a military story and secondarily as a diplomatic story. It's very different, this war was very different from the build-up to the Gulf War in 92 when and much more uh, emphasis was spent on the diplomacy and the military uh, angle was one angle among many rather than the dominant angle. So in other words, even the State Department uh, was covering the stories as if when are we going to war? Or what? No. Uh, it, 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 no. When you went to the State Department correspondent, you covered the di diplomacy. When you went to the United Nations correspondent, you covered the um, inspections for weapons of mass destruction and the debates in the Security Council. It's just uh, that the amount of time that was spent assigning a story to those correspondents was proportionately much less than the amount of time assigning a story to a Pentagon correspondent. Okay, thank you. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, just go ahead and zoom in. Yeah, just, just gonna zoom in and um, check the focus there. Let me, uh, um, Okay, um, so uh, what kind of stories were the uh, military covering? Okay. What was the beat that they were, what kind of yeah. content? Were they? Um, there's, there's two ways uh, to look at how the military correspondents, the Pentagon correspondents, covered, covered the war. One is to say that uh, they weren't treating the debate over going to war seriously. In other words, they were treating war as an inevitability. Second way to look at it is they were accurately treating the war as an inevitability in that they talked to people in the Pentagon and they knew that the diplomacy was irrelevant and that the war was going to happen, whatever happened at the United Nations. So they were either incredibly honest with us, telling us there's no point in worrying about the diplomacy, the only thing that matters is the military, or they were incredibly dismissive of us in, the, in that they said uh, you, what you think or say or do doesn't make any difference at all because the decision is being made for you on your behalf. Right. And uh, what 
and for CBS, for example, did they even have a diplomatic correspondent, or was it? Uh, yeah, uh, the the uh, the old um, the old system of having a full time uh, State Department correspondent and a full time Pentagon correspondent has changed uh, over the years, and now they have a thing called a national. Yeah. Checking the uh, yeah. sound outside. Yeah. Okay, yeah, just, yeah. just go ahead. Uh, um, uh, the, the old, uh, um, 15 or 20 years ago, all the networks had uh, basically two full time foreign, foreign affairs correspondents, one based at the S State Department covering diplomacy and one based at the Pentagon covering defense. Um, and a, a dozen or so years ago, the network started to combine those two tasks under the label of a national security correspondent. And or, or, uh, any uh, story, either covering diplomacy or covering defense uh, from inside the Beltway, would be would be assigned to the to the same correspondent. NBC, in the build-up to the war, had still had two. Uh, ABC started with two, and then um, their Pentagon man retired in the middle of the uh, middle of the uh, Iraq conflict, and they ended up with one. CBS had the one all along, the, uh, based at the Pentagon, David Martin, but he would cover um, diplomacy as well. However, whenever it went to the United Nations, they would uh, they would have a, another another correspondent. So. Um, the debates in the Security Council about the war resolution and the uh, hearings with regard to the weapons of mass destruction and that sort of thing would not tend to be covered from the Pentagon. Okay, and uh, what about covering diplomacy from the White House angle? Yeah, um, uh, the way the networks organize it is that their White House correspondent covers all activities of the president. So it doesn't matter whether the president is engaged in diplomacy or in his capacity as the commander in chief or in domestic affairs. That's always the beat of the White House correspondent. They don't have a separate White House correspondent for foreign affairs and for domestic affairs. Okay, so uh, let's say uh, something that Bush was claiming that they didn't need a second resolution and the rest of the world was saying that we needed a second resolution. Uh, did you notice like any sort of, uh, you know, if it fell under the White House beat or they would report what Bush said without having any sort of counterweight? Okay. Now, the way in which the build-up to the war was uh, handled inside the Beltway, in other words, by the Washington DC bureaus of the, of the various networks, would be in the pecking order of firstly what, what the White House did in a given day, second what the Pentagon did in a given day, thirdly what, um, what the State Department did in a given day. Um, there would be very little coverage, there was very little coverage indeed for instance on a de any debate in Congress about whether, whether there should be a war or not. Now that's inside the Beltway, in other words that's the activities of the US government itself. Now there were occasions in the six months leading up to the war where the development wasn't inside the Beltway, there was actually, the, the US had to deal with some reaction from other governments, either at the United Nations or abroad. So when you'd have a statement uh, from, from, for instance, for instance, when you'd have a statement from the President saying, uh, we don't need to go to the United Nations uh, for a resolution to go to war, uh, if there was a reaction from other governments that would typically be covered by a correspondent in London or at the United Nations or in or in Paris or, 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 or wherever. Um, so there wouldn't be, the reaction wouldn't typically be covered by the White House correspondent, but there would be two stories on, on, on that one issue. One, what Bush said, and one, what, what the reaction would be. Okay, and, and to what extent did the stories from this time period, did they depend or originate at these three beats? Um, yeah, uh, the uh, undercover, Almost all the stories originated inside the Beltway in the, in the lead up to the war. The, the, the story was generated from inside the Bush administration and uh, uh, any reaction uh, to that was always in a response to what had happened from the Bush administration was never initiated from outside. Therefore, there was very little coverage of anti-war protests either inside the United States or abroad, and there was little, there was slightly more coverage, but still little coverage about what the mood was in in Baghdad itself. 
The places where stories were generated outside the Bush administration were with regard to the search for the weapons of mass destruction and uh, Hans Blix's uh, um, uh, operation, which was covered in, in Iraq by correspondents who were based in Iraq. Okay. And um, I think I saw in a Columbia Journalism Review article by Brent Cunningham that you had mentioned like yeah. uh, the 414 stories, all but 34 were originated in the... Um, yeah, I, I can't remember that statistic, but um, uh, I'm, that was right. I did fact check it. I don't have it in my head. The, the, um, um, of all the areas, in retrospect, now that the war has been fought, of all the areas uh, that were completely and utterly undercovered in the build-up to the war, the one that stands out now in retrospect is any planning for how a post-war occupation might go. That was, uh, that was covered even less than the coverage to the opposition to the war. So the, the idea that this uh, story might have any consequences after the fighting, after the invasion had happened, was completely missing from journalists, but also from the administration as well. It was just, it was just uh, a, a, a missing, uh, missing beat from everyone concerned, not, not just from the administration. So would you say that the coverage was dominated by events as opposed to the larger issues and long-term thinking, kind of day-to-day? -day I mean, it sounds a, 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 a silly thing to say, but it's sort of, it's sort of it's funny that it's true. The war was treated as a military matter only. Now, you know, obviously it's a war, so it should be treated as a military matter only, but if war is the continuation of politics by other means, then the entire operation has to be seen as a political and a diplomatic one. And the concentration on Pentagon planning, Pentagon decisions, on human interest stories about members of the armed forces and whether they were going to live or die, seeing the entire enterprise as a purely military one meant that the, meant that the, the policy itself was seen through a set of, uh, of blinders rather than uh, in, 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 in its full uh, aspect. And, and of the uh, military stories, um, kind of the enterprising stories that they were doing, it seemed like they were covering military exercises. Can you speak to the type of exercises there? Yeah, the, the, reason, the reason why um, it was very uh, appealing to the networks to have um, the buildup of the troops in Kuwait as being a major facet of, of the uh, unfolding story was it was uh, one way in which they could uh, personalize and humanize the story by showing actual soldiers who are actually fighting. It was one way in which you could get out of uh, outside the beltway and actually go into the real world so you could see the desert, you could see what the countryside was going to be like. And also, uh, the visuals of that story were very appealing for television in that it's uh, much more interesting to see tanks and guns and jets and rifles and bayonets than it is to see um, uh, briefing rooms and, um, and charts and, and committee members. And, and so to what extent, or have you, what kind of trends have you seen with this story that um, how important is the image and if it doesn't have good images that the story might not be covered? Or, um. Um, the, uh, it, it's, Let's talk about the importance of the image this way. It's uh, action is a very, uh, very dynamic thing on television news. So uh, it isn't so much that it is pretty, but that it's active. And there's nothing like the military to give great images of, of uh, uh, action and uh, machinery and uh, people uh, engaged in dangerous activities, all the sorts of things that appeal in, uh, in visual imagery, not just in journalism, but also in fiction. Okay, great. And how do you see, um, you know, do you track the New York Times to see what influence the New York Times, Washington Post, and major daily newspapers have on television? I, I don't track the New York Times every day, but I have done um, individual studies looking at a, a given six-month period or a given uh, you know, two-month period at various times to see uh, to try and match the story selection on the nightly news with the front page stories that get onto the New York Times. And I look at it both uh, what happened uh, 
the morning before the nightly news came on, and also the morning after the nightly news came on. And uh, what this tells, can reassure any viewer is that the, news, the national news agenda is a stable news agenda. In other words, the things that the networks find newsworthy, newsworthy enough to put on their evening newscasts, are the same things that the editors of the New York Times think are newsworthy enough to, to put on their front page. Now, you can do studies to say, is one following the other? Who is influencing whom? I don't think in the long run that matters. The fact that uh, they're all reflecting the same set of news judgments is the important thing, not who is the leader and who is the follower. And I guess uh, from what I, from my viewpoint, is the enterprising reporting, if something happens in you know, the uh, investigative report that the New York Times does, and then maybe the news would pick yes. up. And, did you see that there was a lack of like really hard-hitting, enterprising, investigative reporting on this issue leading up to the war in Iraq on the news? Um, uh, the, the enterprise reporting uh, that you saw uh, on the television news came almost entirely from the Pentagon. And that was people, people revealing how close they were to getting the absolute plans for war. So um, that was the sort of reporting that was rewarded. In other words, how close to guaranteeing uh, could a correspondent come when the war would start or how it would start. So there was a lot of secret or semi-secret war plans, war planning that got revealed and broken by, by the Pentagon correspondents. It was uh, uh, that the function of that reporting was to register zero skepticism about whether a war would happen. Now, um, there are those who say they had a further function, which was that it was cheerleading for the war. Um, uh, there, are, there are two debates you can have on this. One is, if a reporter knows absolutely for sure that what he says will happen is going to happen, then he's not cheerleading, he's just telling you what the truth is, and you should know that. On the other hand, if uh, the job of the um, propaganda machinery of the Pentagon is to make something that is in doubt seem inevitable, then the Pentagon correspondent is helping them in that effort by assuring us of its inevitability. Is it, I mean, is it also the role of the reporters to raise skepticism and to, uh, to challenge these? I mean, it, these, it, it seemed like that you need to have the, the, the role of media to, to step in and to challenge. Um, if, um, uh, if, say, uh, a, um, an anti-war protester is saying, uh, let's go on a march, because if we show the government how unpopular this war is, we'll be able to change opinion inside the Beltway and stop this war from happening. And a Pentagon correspondent from his inside reporting knows that uh, those people who are deciding whether to go to war or not aren't going to pay any attention whatsoever to that march then he's probably being a skeptical and accurate reporter by saying it doesn't matter whether you march or not, the war's going to happen anyway. Okay, and um, let's see, the... Um, oh, can you talk a little bit about the branding of the war coverage as uh, Countdown Rock, Showdown with Saddam, Road to War? Yeah. Um, uh, branding. When that started. Yeah. Okay, it's, uh, it's the technique of um, television news, generally speaking, when there's a huge story, to give a slogan or a logo or a linking theme around that story so that you have the visual cue to know that you're returning time and time again to a given story. Now, the fact that the networks chose to brand the war or the countdown to the war or the showdown with Iraq or the whatever the slogan they used um, uh, is not an unusual thing and is not specific to the war itself. It, would, it could happen with any major story. If you look at coverage of the, um, of the presidential election, they all have a, a, a brand or a logo for a big story like that looking forward to decision 2004 or whatever. So the fact of a logo is not unusual. In fact, it would have been highly unusual if they hadn't have had a logo. Now, there was a, there was a big um, um, 
ABC especially was very careful not to be seeing that it was rushing to war. And it made a very big deal of the fact that its uh, countdown to battle was called uh, the road to war with a question mark next to it rather than a flat out statement. So in other words, they were, they were trying to imply that the war was not inevitable, that if the war happens, then this is what might happen. That was a subtlety that was uh, initially lost on me and I suspect lost on anybody. But uh, uh, the, the drumbeat of the approach to war is something that's reinforced by this use of logos and, and slogans. And, um, and I don't really think it matters what the actual wording is of the title. Uh, rather than you're being told that it's very important by the fact that they're using all of their graphic design resources in order to, to, to build up to this major event. And do you see that by, by, by calling it this, that they, they eliminated themselves from covering certain stories that would have shown that maybe you know, the world doesn't want this war or there's a lot of opposition at the UN? Or? Um, I, there was... Um, there was no undercoverage of the fact that there was opposition to this war at the UN. There were many stories counting votes inside the Security Council, uh, publicizing the French opposition to it, many stories even about the, um, the attempts to ridicule the French because they, they objected to it. So the key wasn't whether there was opposition at the UN or in Europe or even domestically. The key was to cover how effective that opposition would be in actually preventing the war. Um, now that's, uh, um, in retrospect, the opposition to the war was ineffective at, present, at preventing it. I'm not sure that if it had got more coverage than it did get, whether it would ha have had a better chance at preventing the war. I think in retrospect, uh, the war was pretty much of a done deal and, there, and, and it was going to happen however um, massively the opposition to it had been covered by the news media. So you feel that they would have found a way to go to war no matter what happened? Or? Well, that's the way the White House correspondents and the Pentagon correspondents covered it, that it, was a, that it was a done deal and that once they decided to deploy the troops in Kuwait, there was no pulling back. Now... Um, Obviously, if you're, um, okay, this is an interesting, if you're the Pentagon and you're trying to bluff Saddam Hussein into certain action by making him feel as so though unless he acts in a certain way, then war is going to be inevitable. You would never do anything except to make war seem inevitable, even if it actually wasn't inevitable. So, us being told that the war was inevitable could either have been truth, right, that it was inevitable, or it could have been absolutely necessary perception for the Pentagon to put out in order for them to bluff Saddam Hussein into backing down and behave in the way that he wanted to. So either way, if you're a Pentagon correspondent, you're going to say war is inevitable, if it's the truth or if it's a bluff. Well, from the government's perspective, wouldn't that be illegal, according to the smith munt Act, to prevent PSYOP operations to being conducted within the continental U.S.? Um, yes, I, I, well, I don't know about the law. I, I, at the time when I watched it, I came to the conclusion that bluffing, even though it might work, was actually a bad way of pursuing foreign policy because you're not only bluffing your enemies, you're bluffing your own side as well. And I think um, if you're going to try and go to war, you need as much uh, support as possible. And the way to build support is by being honest with people and not bluffing them. So I think well, I'd, uh, I would say that just on policy grounds rather than grounds of legality, it's probably better if you're honest with people rather than if you're bluffing them. On the other hand, in retrospect, now we look at it, he probably wasn't bluffing. He probably was sincere when he said, we're going to go to war and nothing's going to stop us. Um, and he, that was actually true rather than a bluff. And, and so when you see the, uh, 
the administration giving a, a sort of uh, cover story at first that this mobilization is to enforce the resolutions yes. and then eventually that line was blurred when the threshold is crossed and now those troops are for war and how was that how do you see that that blurring of the line and that coverage over the, that time period? the coverage of the blurring of the line or the blurring of the line itself um, the um, we Let's go back now. I mean, I think in, in this entire line of questioning, the, the important role to look at is the role of the Pentagon correspondents, as I've said before, because um, uh, they were at the one hand most prescient and on the other hand most cynical. Because um, they would, if you actually study the way they reported on the build-up to war, they may have inserted a few phrases like, if it comes to that, or, you know, um, uh, if the worst comes to the worst, or something like that. But the general tone of their coverage was that these uh, troops were being deployed in order to go to war. And, um, and almost all of their coverage was um, how the war would happen, rather than how the bluff would happen. Um, uh, so as far as the Pentagon correspondents were concerned, the blurring of that line between deploying troops in order to threaten war and deploying troops for war happened much earlier than the explicit statements of the President or of, or of the Secretary of State or even the Secretary of Defense himself. So um, if you really wanted to know what was going to happen, not what should happen, but what was going to happen, the good people to listen to would have been the Pentagon correspondents, in retrospect. Right. Um, and how do you... Uh... I mean, okay, I mean, this is, this is the crux of, of, of this entire debate, which is, what are reporters there for? A reporter's there to tell you what's going to happen, so you're informed, or a reporter's there to help you uh, decide what should happen, so that you might be able to have some impact on changing people's minds. Um, it seems in this particular instance, in this story, it would, it would have been really difficult for reporters to fulfill both roles. Because um, if they gave people the impression that their job was to decide what should happen rather than what will happen, I think they would have given people who didn't want to go to war false hope that they actually had a chance at changing the policy. So, so whose role is it? I mean, is it the print reporters, news reporters, to ask those questions then? Or I, well, I, I think in, in, I mean, first and foremost, in the United States of America, the job is the Congress of the United States. That's, uh, they're the people who are supposed to uh, uh, monitor the, 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 the role of the commander-in-chief and, and uh, restrain him when he's acting uh, rashly. And uh, if you're going to look at any institution in the entire country that failed to um, be skeptical about, about the, the rush for war, the, I mean, I would say that it was the Congress that, was, uh, that, w that headed that line. Okay, and then, and then after that, that the media was just going being honest and reporting what was going to happen. After, um, after October 14th. I, I'm, I'm talking specifically about the Pentagon correspondents more than anybody else. Um, um, uh, if, the, if the choice is to be honest and cynical or to give false hope, then I think they're probably better off being honest and cynical. Okay. Um, if that's the choice. <laughs> right. Now, how did you, have you done comparisons on this issue ABC versus CBS versus yeah, I, I did I did some and I and it was as, as I said okay, no, sorry. yeah Just... a, 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 there were marginal differences between the three networks in their tone um, uh, leading up to the war uh, the biggest um, uh, most obvious one was that uh, question mark that ABC put on its road to war logo uh, making the entire enterprise seem more in doubt than the other two networks did. When, once the war started, there were, there were big differences. Um, the major differences were in the status of each network's correspondence inside Baghdad itself, because once the war started, there was a huge difference in how the war looked from the Iraqi side. And um, CBS had its um, 
its crew thrown out. So its overall, the overall tone of its war coverage was um, uh, lacking in coverage of what the Iraqi point of view was because their, their people weren't there physically inside Baghdad. Um, ABC and NBC both had people there. NBC's uh, got interrupted halfway through because it had been taking its feed from Peter Arnett, who um, was fired when he was um, too vociferous in opposing the war for NBC's taste. So at the end, ABC had the most coverage from the, from the Iraqi point of view. But that was during the war rather than before the war. OK. And um, let's see. Uh, uh, yeah, the the um, the coverage of the build-up to the war, which relied so heavily on the Pentagon correspondence, continued once the fighting had started, where most coverage from the field was from embedded reporters, and most um, consultants, analysts, and experts that were hired as in in house by the networks to give them advice what to do were former military brass. There were very few. Uh, 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 scholars or human rights experts or diplomatic experts or Arabists or th that sort of people who are hired as experts. Almost all the expertise in-house by all the networks was military expertise. So again, you have that funny thing that the war was miscovered because it was covered as a military enterprise. So that, can you, and that was including leading up to the war, are you saying, what, can you kind of characterize the different... What kind of experts would they go to uh, yeah. during? Yeah, uh, all, all, of, all of the networks uh, hired, um, hired consultants uh, which were um, on their own payroll, who weren't journalists but had expertise in other areas. And they would n r routinely be used not to file a story but to be used for sound bites in a story where the correspondent would take a, a phrase and then edit it into the story or for an in-studio uh, interview where an anchor would say, now tell us about this, tell us about this. Now the routine on all of the networks and the cable channels as well was to uh, overstaff their roster of consultants with former, uh, former military officers and uh, have very few uh, consultants who, were, who had expertise outside of the military area. And therefore, the, um, it, w it was not only the diplomacy that got undercovered, the nuances of the diplomacy that got, got undercovered, but also the entire enterprise of uh, post-war reconstruction and how an occupation would be run, where the military are la relatively lacking in expertise and you'd want people who had uh, expertise working for the United Nations or, or in, uh, in non-governmental organizations or in, uh, in human rights capacities. Okay. And, um, can you talk to um, the issue of international law is an issue that doesn't have a lot of visuals and images. So can you speak to, is that one of the reasons why it was, it, maybe is it too complicated? And is it's it international law. Um, um, trying to think what the um, you know um, international law is not the sort of topic that would be covered as such on television network news just like um, uh, international trade would be another example of something that would not be covered as such. That doesn't mean the, uh, the beat doesn't get covered, but it's the consequences of the disputes around that area that get covered rather than the abstract notions themselves. So international trade gets covered when you have um, protests in the street against the World Trade Organization or you have people getting laid off because factories have gone to China or something like that. International law gets covered when you have people being tortured or when you have uh, um, uh, uh, disputes you know, inside the United Nations about whether a certain resolution is going to be passed or not. It's, not the, it's the, the consequences of those disputes that get covered rather than the substance of them. Because what I, Michael uh, Gettler, of the Ombudsman of, yes. my, of the Washington Post, yes. wrote a column within the last couple of weeks talking about leading up to the war. There are some stories 
that we buried within the paper, one of which was many legal scholars disagree with the legal justification for war, and it was held off until March 18th. Okay. Yes. So it seemed like even legal scholars were disagreeing it from all the way starting back right. in November. Yeah. And all the, this is, that's the substance of France, what they're well, saying. So well, it yes. seemed like the, the substance of the nature of the debate was being covered. Let's let yes, I, I, I'm, the nature of the debate about why why the United States was planning to go to war and whether it was justified in making those decisions was was uh, unclear, was obscure, not just on the grounds of international law, but actually also on specific policy grounds. There were many different rationales that were given for war, and sometimes uh, two or three of them simultaneously. And it was never clear at all why the war was being started. Not just whether it was legal or not, but actually why, what the, what the actual motives were. Um, again, the, um, the clarity with which the Pentagon was covered, not why are we going to war, but we, this is how the how of going to war rather than the why. We stood in stark contrast to both the diplomatic debate and also the political debate, where, where things were much less clear than with the Pentagon. And I think one of the reasons why so much coverage came from the Pentagon was because there, there were things that Pentagon correspondents were able to say with clarity how the war would be fought. Whereas diplomatic correspondents and political correspondents had a, a very hard time explaining why the war was being fought. Because I, I, I did, I mean, the reason why they had a hard time explaining was because it was obscure. Is there, I mean, what is your sense of, of, of why the war happened? Is it even? I, 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 to this day, I have no idea. I don't, I don't know. Okay, so uh, i just say that. Oh, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe they went to war like Bill Clinton said, because they could. Um, let's see, I, to, I don't want you to quote me saying that. But, oh, no, <laughs> that's, that's fine. Uh, yeah, yeah, just. I sound like I don't know. What oh, right, just say I don't know. Like as a full sentence. Sorry, without the, the question. To to this day, I don't know why the United States went to war with Iraq. And you've gained no insight from the news media as to why, or I mean, that they, is that is that something that no they no be no the the, the, ins the insight I got from the news media was that the. Uh, motives were unclear. I don't think there was a clear reason that the news media have failed to reveal. I think the news media have revealed how unclear the reasons were. Okay. Accurately revealed how unclear the reasons were. And there also seemed to be a shift after the war. Uh, there, was, there was a shift in the build-up to the war. Right. So there was the shift between uh, we're going to have to go back to the Security Council for a second vote. We don't need to. So was the war, did the, did the war have to be authorized by a second vote or not? That, that happened in the build-up to the war. And people just changed their minds and they didn't explain to you why they changed their minds. They just said they did. Um, I don't think the news media was um, lacking in clarity uh, because the picture that we received from them was a confused one. I think they were clearly reporting the confusion. But from my perspective, I saw that there was a debate over the international law, that our closest allies, Britain and Australia, yes. everyone wanted the second relationship. They were saying that under law, we, they needed it. But the reporters were just reporting what the Bush administration was saying, and then when, the, when there was that switch, that, that exactly, that thing happened where they just, they just said, okay, they just changed their minds. I mean, that, no well, they, they did, the, but, they, well, but what are you telling me? That there was an explanation that was uncovered? The, yeah, the, 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 all along. You see, that, you're saying there was, that, a re, there was a real... There was a reason, that there was a reason okay. why that, that none of the television, that, that not even the New York Times or editor and publisher, that there are reasons why that those shifts were made at the answers that were available you know, as early as October and November, that people were out there saying, you have to do this under international law, which explains all the behavior. Okay. Um, explains the behavior. 
if you say you need to get this second resolution, then uh, that's what Britain was saying in the debates, you know. Well, now. no, hold on. Britain said we need a second resolution. Then we said, then Britain said, um, uh, we're not going to abide by an unreasonable veto. And then they said, if we have a majority, it doesn't matter whether the minority is vetoed or not. And then it said, we don't need a majority. And then it said, we don't need a vote. Uh, Britain said those, I, 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 that's my reconstruction. Those shifts in the in statement by the British government were accurately reported by the major news media here. Except for what's the right answer. There's a correct answer, and it's because it's law, so, right? Um, um, well, I'm not a lawyer. I'm a media analyst. So, I mean, I don't know... Um, um, is, is the, except there's a right answer. Let's put it this way. They can't have been right at all stages of those five points. They've, there's got to be some where they were, they were less right than they were at other ones. Um, uh, they changed their minds more quickly than the law did. Shall we say that? Um, now, um, um, I don't, my, you know, looking back on the coverage, looking back on the way it was covered from the point of view of international law, which is the line of questioning that you're following here, um, it was certainly never covered in a way that would make us American viewers believe that the overriding uh, important criterion about the decision to go to war was whether it was legal or not under international law. We were never, we were, it was never, that was never presented to us as the, as the, um, the, the binding decision about whether war would happen would be its legality or not. And again, I would, I think that that would be another uh, example of cynically accurate reporting. That there was, the, 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 there was, that was actually a true representation of the way the Bush administration felt, that the legality of the war was neither here nor there, but or was not, was not going to be a deterrent from them conducting the war. The fact that it was illegal wasn't going to stop them, if it was illegal. The point is, looking too closely into the question, is it legal or is not legal, was not a, uh, was not a, um, a binding, uh, uh, wasn't binding on their decision. It seems like a lot of the diplomatic coverage that was being covered was being framed from do we have enough votes for war yet, as opposed to what is the nature of the debate. If you listen to the nature of the debate, the nature of the debates we're talking about is the war legal. You know, do we you need the second resolution? Well, there were other debates as well, which is um, uh, were there weapons of mass destruction there? There were, I mean, there was a whole lot of that debate being covered and about, about you know, when, when uh, Blix made one report and made another report. And that was a lot of the coverage from, um, from the United Nations was on that issue rather than on, on the war itself. And uh, um, but that was similarly inconclusive. I mean, um, you know, nowadays people say, looking back on it, everyone agreed that there were weapons of mass destruction there. But if you actually looked at the Blix reports, he never said that. He said that it hadn't been proved that there weren't any. Or it hadn't been, the paperwork to prove the destruction of them was incomplete. Um, and in fact, there was an interview by Dan Rather of, of Colin Powell, where that was, that was his bottom line case for the war, was um, the reason for the war was because Iraq's paperwork was out of order. Right, no, that's, that's what I see as well, that, there, that there's these things that, that, that come out 
you know, that they say, oh, everyone agreed, but there was Scott Ritter, he didn't agree, you know, there yes. was Jonathan Landy of Knight Ritter doing reporting, yes. there was Julian yes. Borger, there was all the, David Albright, all these people who were raising questions about the substance of the actual aluminum tubes, all the evidence, lots of people questioning. But yes. It seemed like there wasn't a lot of skeptic voices. Which, which goes, well, which goes back to the, I mean, we're going around in circles here, but the, that goes back to the point, which is, um, uh, it, does, it, it didn't look then, and it certainly doesn't look now, as though the reason to go to war was anything to do with weapons of mass destruction. It seemed as though uh, the, war, the, the war had been decided on not for that reason. So do you see that the, the Bush administration was treating the United Nations as a pretext to go to war and to have this international legitimacy? Uh, uh, do I see that, or does, do I think that's how they were, it was portrayed by the news media? How it was portrayed by the news media? How was it portrayed by... Okay, um, my reconstruction of it is that the, um, the build-up the build up of troops in Kuwait getting ready to go to war could not have happened without um, it being conducted underneath a United Nations resolution. If, they, if the troops had, and that would be the way it was portrayed, that the troops were initially deployed to be in Kuwait pursuant to a United Nations resolution. Then what happened in the coverage was the actual dynamics of the troop deployment both from the coverage from inside the Pentagon, but also coverage of the troops there in Kuwait, the human interest coverage, the action footage, just the sheer logistics of, of that number of people massing ready for battle. That became the driving force of the coverage and the, um, the niceties of the debate inside the United Nations uh, was, um, uh, was there as a, um, as a warning sign if things go badly, you're not going to have much support back home, but not as a veto. And if you look at it politically now, that's, that's probably an accurate way in which the entire enterprise has, has unfolded, which is the fact that uh, the war was uh, entered into in a spirit of bluff rather than a spirit of support. It was entered into on shaky uh, legal grounds rather than firm legal grounds, that it was done as a... a, a, as a um, uh, unilateral or narrow, narrowly multinational rather than a global uh, battle. All of those things are things that have um, come back. The, those are things that were accurately reported at the time. The fact that uh, the, the war was being entered into as a, a huge risk by the administration and that reporting has been vindicated now. Hmm. Right, right. And one thing that I I mean, I, I don't think anywhere in 1441 or any yes. explicit resolution did they mandate that the United States send troops over there. Is that what you're saying, that, that, that it was sent in support directly or implicitly by the United States? Uh, yes, I, 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 yes, what I'm saying is, uh, yes, I, again, I'm, I'm not talking in legal terms at all here. I'm just talking in terms of, in terms of um, when, when, you are, when you're the government and you're conducting actions that are in full view of the news media and, uh, and the Congress and the public, there are certain things that have to happen for you, for you to protect yourself against charges that these actions are reckless or outrageous. And that's, that's how I'm interpreting the narrative of the UN resolution. I'm not saying, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I, I don't think it mattered to either the, the American public or to the news media or to, or to Congress, the actual fine print of that resolution. What mattered was when these troops are being sent all over that way and seemingly getting ready for battle, is that from something that's just been, just come out of the clear blue sky or just fully formed out of somebody's brain? Or was it pursuant to some actual case that's been made in, in, in front of a world body? And that's the way in which that troop deployment was perceived at the time. And I think, and I think it was reported as, as that at the time. I think um, no, no uh, White House correspondent or Pentagon correspondent who reported on the troop deployment to Kuwait did so 
out of the context of the search for weapons of mass destruction, which was, had been uh, authorized by the UN resolution, a unanimous UN resolution. And that was the way in which that was portrayed at the time when it happened. All right, and I mean, just. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, just a couple more minutes. Uh, let's see. The and how do you have you rated or kind of qualified? Like how 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 do you evaluate? Do you evaluate how well they performed leading up to the war? No, no just descript descriptively. I mean, the, the 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 evaluation I do is in, in terms of um, you know. Uh, what resources they deployed, you know, how much time they spent on various angles of the story, you know, what was their lead and what wasn't their lead. Now, the quality of their, the quality of their reporting is something that I, that's not, that's not my, my task. However, what I can say is that um, when you actually examine what angles they chose to take and where they chose to deploy their resources, you can see the, the, uh, the sins of omission much more clearly than you can see the sins of commission. In other words, it wasn't what they did, it was what they failed to do. That's the most obvious thing. And uh, even though um, anti-war protesters claim justifiably that their protests were undercovered, uh, I think the, um, the undercoverage of the protests against the war uh, is insignificant compared with the undercoverage of the planning for the occupation, which was... Um, I mean, because that was something that the, um, the Washington DC bureaus of the networks could anticipate would, was going to happen. The lack of a war happening was a lot more questionable than whether there would be an occupation happening. And that would have been, you know, so they knew that was going to happen. And so that would have, that wasn't a theoretical debate, that was a practical debate. And that was the thing that wasn't covered. And at the end of... Um the story segments, it yes. seems that a lot of correspondents will want to throw in a lot of anonymous sources or, you know, yes. we heard this inside scoop. Yes. Can you talk about that last that's, that's I mean, that's routine, at the, especially at the Pentagon. At the White House and the Pentagon. Oh, sorry, what is routine? Yes. Uh, both, at the White, both at the Pentagon and the White House, um, uh, there's an awful lot of reporting that goes on where the, the, the planning or the expectations or the spin of the institution is told to the reporter and they haven't got a soundbite to justify that, so they've got to say it themselves. Um, unlike uh, uh, newspapers where um, uh, the, the tone of a, um, of a statement is very similar whether it's attributed or whether it's given a blind source, you're reading one paragraph after another and, and it all looks, that has the same tone of voice. There's a radically different tone of voice in television news between a soundbite for attribution where you actually have Rumsfeld saying something or, 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 or Colin Powell saying something or George Bush saying something and a, a rumor or a, a hint or a, a blind source or an expectation or a spin that's given by a, by a correspondent. So the uh, use of blind sources on television is a lot less pernicious than it is in newspapers because, be, because those little tidbits that you get on television uh, have much less punch than a soundbite does. So they, ha they come out of the reporter's mouth, not out of an official's mouth, and are therefore worth less because they come out of the reporter's mouth. Hmm. So they're worth less, but it seemed like there's also a tone change that they would say things in the unnamed sources yes. that they wouldn't be saying in the headline. But you, therefore you give the headline, you give the headline and the name source and the actual soundbite much more credibility because it has a name to it, it has a tone of voice to it, it's, you have the context in which it's said. Something that the reporter slips in at the end that he was told by some source is something that, um, that not only should you give less credibility to because the person is not standing behind what they're saying, but also in the vocabulary of television news, it actually is less powerful because it's, it's said as a third person statement rather than a direct statement. And you can't see, see the expression on the person's face when they're saying it or the context in which they're saying it. And that's what gives power to television news when you actually see a talking head telling you something. Okay, and I think let's see, there's any... Oh, did you know, what did you notice on um, Colin Powell's speech on uh, February 5th, kind of that time period, the, the reaction? The coverage. The, 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 um, Colin Powell, when he was at the security, Colin Powell, 
Okay, Colin Powell at the Security Council giving the best intelligence estimate uh, that he possibly could about the proof that uh, weapons of mass destruction did in fact exist inside Iraq. Um, that was one of those occasions where television news do goes differently from reporting on the nightly news in that it was much more like a C-SPAN moment. And there are those very important occasions where television uh, ceases to become a journalistic medium and becomes a, um, a display medium, as it were, where it's unmediated. In the, the reporter doesn't do any mediation. We just hear the person speak and judge it for itself. So um, that's, uh, that's a completely different tone of voice um, uh, uh, from journalism on television, uh, the actual statement, hearing the actual presentation itself. Uh, when you actually study how the speech was covered rather than how the speech was covered later by reporters, other than how it was presented, unedited, unmediated by television, then almost all of the claims that he made, that Powell made in the Security Council, were questioned in the reporting on the speech. The, the questioning of them by French people or by Arab people or by Iraqi people, etc., etc., had less weight than the un unmediated speech itself by Powell. But I wouldn't call that journalism, I'd call that something else, displaying the speech itself. The other important thing that happened around the same time as Powell made his speech, of course, was Dan Rather went to uh, Baghdad and interviewed Saddam Hussein himself. And Saddam Hussein said that he didn't have any weapons. It seemed like uh, through the whole time they were saying they weren't, didn't have any weapons. Right, but this is you actually got the soundbite from him. Right, right. So, and, um, okay. And I think that's, that's it. Do you have any last uh, thoughts? That's, that's okay. I've, I've told you what I think. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs>